Mm. <laughs> Feel bad though, they Oh, hey, Jim.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the June Tech Talk. Happy to have you all here. Um, I hope that you all had an enjoyable Memorial Day. And uh, I and that is why we didn't have the May uh, Tech Talk, but we're very excited to be back and should have them at least through September and hopefully continuing to infinity. So uh, just to start off, I'm going to go over um, MITRE as a corporate overview so that you all can get a feel of the kind of work that we do here. Um, so MITRE, addressing critical challenges. So MITRE was established in 1958 as a not-for-profit organization. Um, we work in a conflict-free environment. So what that means is as a not-for-profit working for the sponsors that we have, we we very much try to avoid uh, conflict of interest and we try and maintain objectivity in the opinions and the experience that we have. We are working for our sponsors rather than working to make a profit for ourselves as seen by the not-for-profit. Um, and by doing that, we're able to provide more information and expertise to the government and work with them closer, government and industry. We work with um, both, uh, areas. Um, and we specialize within science and technology. So on to the next one. And at this time, uh, MITRE only operates FFRDCs, which are federally funded and research, federally funded research and development centers. So MITRE has been around uh, since 1958, and we've been doing a lot of key work in trying to define standards and bring about new technologies um, to improve the the um, tech space, but specifically to uh, push the the bleeding edge of technology and to make what seems impossible to some more possible, or at least to be able to say this is how to implement something correctly, so that people don't have to spend the same amount of time that our MITRE experts go through in order to figure out that process. So, um, and within the time from 1958 to the present, we've had quite a few. Uh, honorable mentions, I guess, or things that have come from MITRE. For example, um, the WorldWind computer, which was the first digital electronic real-time computer. Um, also, the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, CVE, if you're familiar with that, along with uh, CWE and KPEC. Um, and those were to you know, define what vulnerabilities and weaknesses existed within systems 
in order to classify where those vulnerabilities are and to allow others to be able to, to fix and understand where they might be weak in defenses and with the, the systems and software they had. And then more recently, uh, there's the attack framework, which very nicely ties into our presentation today on cyber threat intelligence. So what that is, is it defines basically the tactics, techniques, and procedures. I believe I got that correct, TTPs. Um, and that is uh, trends and, and activities that have been noticed in malicious behavior or campaigns against certain organizations in order to classify where that might be coming from and how to stop that. So very important, especially with all the malware that's running around nowadays. Um, and then, uh, so a little bit more about FFRDCs. Um, we rely on objectivity and independence. So as I mentioned before, we're trying to you know, remain unbiased and approach the, the problems that we are faced with you know, from, a, from what exists out there without saying what will make money or something of that sort. And by doing that, we are able to work both in the public interest and have a long-term relationship with our sponsors. So by taking that not-for-profit objectivity, we are able to get more information from our sponsors and better understand the problems that they are facing in order to see the full picture and be able to work from there to come up with a solution. Um, and then we're in doing the working for the public interest and having a long-term relationship with our sponsors, we're able to remain strategic partners for them. So today we operate seven FFRDCs anywhere from, or ranging from the National Security Engineering Center. So that is trying to find the information that may hint towards uh, malicious activity within the world and hopefully be able to stop some of those attacks that are occurring um, to the Center for Advanced Aviation System Development and then Center for Enterprise Mod Modernization, the Homeland Security Systems Engineering and Development Institute, Judiciary Engineering and Modernization Center and CMS Alliance to Modernize Healthcare, all of those I set them all together and that is for a reason because they are all very much trying to bring those industries up to uh, where the current standard is and help them to modernize and innovate from the, the current place that they are so that they are able to do their jobs better from a system engineering standpoint. Then there's also the National Cybersecurity FFRDC, which is the first cybersecurity only, well not only, but it is related fully to cybersecurity and how to address the um, the threats that are being faced in addition to you know being able to defend um, our sponsors and the the public from attacks that are occurring so uh, the capabilities we rely on critical problem solving as i stated we're trying to push the bleeding edge and so because of that we have to really think critically um, about what we're facing because there aren't, in some cases, there isn't any research into what we are looking into. And so we have to kind of define that and figure out how the how whatever it is works in order to understand how to either protect it or you know improve the process. Um, we are heavy into science and mathematics, but those that can range into a wide variety of areas. And I mean, MITRE has projects that do almost everything and related to that cyber projects related to almost any area. And so that's, that's really cool because working at MITRE, you know, you can, the project you start off on or the project that you're working on at that moment doesn't have to be what you're working on forever. You can switch from doing something that is in a completely different area, like uh, for example, uh, aviation, and then you switch to something that is related to um, like uh, security operation centers or something of that sort. And so you can very much get a taste of what you enjoy and you find the area that you fit in the best and what you would enjoy working on. And you can continue to develop your career that way. And if you have change of mind later on, then you find other projects that are more in line with where you wanna go. So it's a really cool place to work. Um, and on that topic, uh, this is the, some or the seventy-three thousand or seventy-three hundred employees is a little bit out of date. We're over eight thousand now, um, and constantly growing, constantly looking to grow. So, if you're interested 
in MITRE, feel free to reach out to me. I'm at, my, or at techtalks at MITRE.org, the email that I was using to send emails to all of you. Um, and so feel free to, to send resumes to there um, and I will get them to wherever they wanna be. Feel free to, to tell me, hey, I'm interested in this area and I can direct it to the areas within MITRE that you would like uh, to hear more about. Um, and for our employees, we have a 67% advanced degrees, um, which is pretty awesome. We've got a lot of smart people that work at MITRE, a lot of people that are into furthering themselves and furthering the research that is available. Uh, we tend to hold on to our people a lot, uh, 25, or sorry, 12 years average tenure, and most of those people are an average of 25 years experience. And there's a large gamut of the type of people at MITRE, anywhere from people who are a little bit newer like me, I've been here for about a year now, to people who have worked at MITRE their entire career and are continuing to work at MITRE because they love the work that we do here. So um, our speaker tonight is Sam, uh, and she's gonna be talking about cyber threat intelligence. So welcome, Sam. Nope. Yep. So I'm going to try not to use the microphone because I think this is kind of a small group and everybody can hear me okay, right? Until we get in. How much time do I have? An hour? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, wait, I need to use the microphone because we're recording. And we're on YouTube. We're on YouTube. Cool dude. Okay. And just put that in your pocket. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get the YouTube memo. All right. Cool dude. So, a um, little bit of a background when I'm hearing about MITRE. Excuse me. Um, hearing about MITRE a little bit. I want to kind of caveat something just a little bit. So I'm probably one of, I am adjusting my pants here, so I apologize. Um, I'm one of the non-engineers. So even though it says principal cybersecurity engineer, um, I'm actually a, a cyber threat analyst. And so I'm kind of the odd duck here at MITRE, and there's numerous times that I will be, um, that is so odd, walking, I will be walking around MITRE and talking to people, and, they're, and I'm like, what do you do? And they're like, Python scripting and reverse engineering malware and and other things. I'm like, hey, great. And they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm a threat analyst. I work with identity intelligence and SOC optimization. And then we're like, that's nice. And we kind of walk away from each other. So the reason I kind of caveat that is if this brief is not very technical or in depth, um, there's a reason for it. Uh, what we're trying to do tonight is kind of give you an idea of the different things that MITRE gets involved in, the different projects. Um, and the different areas. So as background, um, I actually was an intern with MITRE, and I'm not gonna say how many years ago, but we didn't call them interns at the time, we called them seasonal hires. And then I went, uh, finished my college degree, and then I became a special agent with NCIS, that's a federal law enforcement agency. There is a TV show with Mark Harmon. No, it's nothing like the TV show. Um, but that's what I did, so I carried a gun, carried a badge. And for a long time, uh, when I first joined NCIS, I was in the counter narcotics division um, in Southern California. So we used to say like, you know, I did drugs and, um, you know, I bought a lot of acid. And so I can talk to you a lot about acid and how much it costs. And we just had people walk in the room, so this is gonna get really awkward. Um, but, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay. So I, but what happened was we're, we're talking uh, the early 90s. So there wasn't a lot of computers on people's desks. When I first joined NCIS, we would do reports. Uh, the older agents had uh, tape recorders and they would tape their reports into the recorder, give it to the secretaries who would use dictaphones and type the reports on typewriters. And then this newfangled thing with computers came up um, and they tried to force us, you know, police officers how to learn computers. And I was young, I was new, I was aggressive. Um, I actually had worked on a Unix system. I actually paid my way through college by typing in VI. 
Um, I actually like VI. I thought it was wonderful. Um, you never took your hands off the keyboard. But uh, I'm dating myself here, right? So uh, then what happened was because I could plug in a printer and I could actually make the printer work, um, all of a sudden uh, we had some issues with some crime, some, some criminals and some intelligence, and they started using computers and it was floppy diskettes. And so they came to me and they said, hey, you know how to plug in a printer. You probably could get this information off of the floppy diskette. So hence, we started computer forensics. And the computer forensics meant plugging the floppy diskette into the computer and printing everything off of the floppy diskette, because that's what we did. Um, and then hard drives came along. And the hard drives at the time, seriously, were like 10 gig, five, you know, 15 gig, maybe 30 gig. Um, and again, we pretty much went into the computer, you know, plugged it in, printed everything that was in there off, because we printed everything. Um, and so then as time went on, forensics uh, got a little bit bigger. Uh, and, you know, we're, now we have NCASE, we have FDK, we have all this software out there. But one day when I was with NCIS, um, some dude walks in. I'm from Southern California, so he was a dude. And uh, he's some IT guy. And he came out of the basement or something like that on the military base. And he came into our office and he wanted to report a crime. And we were like, what is this crime? And he goes, somebody's in our network. And I just, you know, kind of gave him the glazed over look. And I'm like, you know, uh, what do you want me to do about it? He's like, I think somebody's intruded upon our network. It's a, it's a hacker or something. And I don't know what they're doing. And it's illegal. And he tried to explain to me a time and time again about how it's illegal. I didn't get it. So fast forward a couple of years. Now I kind of get it about intrusions. So that's kind of the background very, very realistically of how we got into working intrusions. And if any, nobody in here is as probably as old as I am when I talk about, this was going back to like moonlight maze, Titan rain. So when we name intrusion sets. So then what happened was um, it got to the point where uh, we were doing intrusions, uh, incident forensics, incident response for Navy Marine Corps. I since retired from NCIS. I went and ran a government SOC, um, very large security operations center for two years, decided I didn't like running a 24 seven operations center and then eventually came back over to MITRE. So within MITRE, I do kind of a couple different things. I work on SOC op optimization. The SOC is a security operations center. When we look at optimization, what tools, processes, procedures we can bring in to make the, process, to make the whole operation center run a little bit more smoothly. And then also from a security operations center standpoint, um, I also work in a classified environment, and that's all I'm going to say about a classified environment. But what I do there is I work on identity intelligence. And that's kind of where this brief is going to go today. So when I talk about identity intelligence, um, we're talking about identifying the person. So since we're talking about cyber, I'm identifying the cyber hacker. Um, there is a National Security Presidential Memorandum number seven that um, hit the streets about two years ago that stated that they would like to have five more centers of excellence for identity intelligence. Right now, there's already one for terrorism within the community. And the, the database on that is called TIDE. Um, and what happened is after 9-11, they figured out there was different government agencies um, within the US government that had information on the, on the terrorists that took down the, the, the airplanes and caused 9-11, um, those tragedies. So they mandated in the US government that everybody share the information, that you bring it into one database, into one center. So they now have created a huge center and a huge database with information regarding terrorists. And it will be height, weight, biometrics, facial recognition, DNA, because a lot of times when terrorists have bombs over in Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Iraq, um, when you touch a bomb and you build a bomb, you can leave your fingerprints on it, um, but you also can leave your DNA on there. So within the terrorism field, it's very robust for identity intelligence. The National Security Presidential Memorandum wanted five more centers of excellence. Those centers are for uh, weapons of mass destruction, anybody doing biochemical type of activity, organized crime, um, that would be your Russians, things like that, uh, Cali cartel. Um, but also foreign intelligence, military intelligence, and the last one was cyber threat actors. So the reason that we do this is, think about this. Um, you know, we know that they hack into our systems. They may steal our IP, um, intellectual property. But what happens if um, a hacker from China, Russia, North Korea, Iran decides to come across into the United States to go to DEF CON, Black Hat, uh, go to university, you know, University of Texas, uh, Georgia Tech, whatever. Um, how does TSA or anybody actually catch that person? 
So that's one of the projects that I'm involved in is helping the engineers develop it. I'm the analyst um, on the project. So if you can imagine, I'm the customer. So I say I want two parallel lines that intersect and the engineers tell me they can't build that. And then I go off and cry because I want skins on my UI and, and they're still not giving me skins. I don't, I don't get it. But anyway, so cyber threat intelligence. I want to go over what, that's my background. That's kind of what I do with MITRE. So what I'd like to do today is kind of brief you on what cyber threat intelligence is. And uh, so we're going to go from there. So the first thing is cyber threat intelligence. Why do you have cyber threat intelligence? So we talk about indicators that you can put into a, a firewall or if you have antivirus software. So you can have the file name, you have heuristics, you have attributes of a file of malicious software. I'm going to try to keep this not horribly technical. Raise your hand if you have questions, but I'm going to kind of keep it down a little bit. Not sure where everybody's skill set is. But cyber threat intelligence, cyber intelligence brings a, um, a lot of information together. So for example, I just don't know want, want to know the heuristics or the attributes of some malicious software. I want to know what country it came from. I want to know what they're targeting, what information they're going after, how they act, how they behave when they get in your network, and what they're going to do with the information after they steal it. Is it a state sponsored? Is it a state that's, that's pushing to find that information? So it's not just to build the cyber network defense, but how do you get preemptive? How do you know what they're gonna come after ahead of time? How do I know if the Chinese are after a certain aircraft carrier or certain airplane or certain technology? What company has that technology? What are they gonna to do to get there? How are they gonna get there? So cyber threat intelligence is bringing a lot of information together. So it's fusing a lot of reports. And the intent is to make your network defense better, but not only network defense, but to make your operations and your investigations. So think about it from a law enforcement standpoint. I want to go arrest the person if they come across the border. Um, if you're in the military, um, they call it, unfortunately, putting metal on the target. Um, you want to stop the person. So how do you conduct those operations if you don't know who they are? You know, How do I arrest them at DEF CON if I don't know what they look like and who they are? So um, let me give you, hold on, let me back up. Let me give you a little analogy, a little law enforcement analogy that I usually use. This building here at MITRE, multiple windows, multiple doors, seven stories. I think it's seven stories. The one next door is seven stories. Let's say base, the security here calls up the police, Fairfax County police. And they tell me, you know, police come up, lights and sirens, and they go, we have an intruder in the building. And I come up and I say, okay, you have an intruder. What does the intruder look like? I don't know, but I know they're here. How did they get in your building? Don't know. Did they come in the front door? Yeah, I don't know, but they're here. They're here. Yeah. Uh, how long have they been here? Don't know. Uh, could be a couple days, could be months. Um, did they steal anything? Don't know. Don't know. Okay. That's what we used to do when we used to do incident response 15, 20 years ago. We didn't know how they got into the network, didn't know where they were, didn't know who they were, didn't know what they were taking because they were copying things. How did they get off the network if they were still there? Logging, intent, you know, what do they look like? So incident response. So just think about that. When I go up and I go to somebody that's running a network, if they don't have the logging, they don't have the proper, you know, uh, tripwire set up, they're not going to have the information to be able to say what happened. So let's talk about intelligence versus a feed, because a lot of times if you're out there running a security operations center, or if you're looking at particular vendors that have threat intelligence, you're gonna be hearing about cyber threat intelligence, but you're also gonna be hearing about a cyber threat feed. They are two different things. So cyber threat intelligence, again, is just not the heuristics on the file. So for example, an antivirus vendor, if you go out to Norton McAfee, they're giving you information about a file to be able to block that file so it doesn't come onto your network. That information could be a hash. It can be a signature that's been developed to identify that file, a signature to develop a, if that file executes on a system. It could just be something as basic as the name of the file. So a cyber threat intelligence is not the feed. It brings it all together. So a cyber threat intelligence, again, is not just the attributes of the file, what country, who did it, why they did it, the information, how they act. It's a little bit more than if you hear the term TTP, which is tactics, techniques, and pro protocols or procedures. It's a little bit more than that. So the companies that do these cyber threat intelligence reports, usually you hear FireEye, you hear APT1, you hear CrowdStrike, you hear like Fuzzy Bear, Happy Bear, uh, Putter Panda, you'll hear those terms. 
Those are cyber threat intelligence. That's cyber threat intelligence. The cyber threat feed is actually going to be the attributes of the file. And I'm going to use antivirus as an example. But cyber threat feeds are the machine to machine learning attributes of those files of that activity that can be passed into a security operations center and implemented into a SIEM and implemented into the other firewalls, logging, anything else that they may have there. So a cyber threat feed is just going to be the attributes of the file or the attribute of the activity, something that a machine can find or lock onto, block, drop, you know, or they can run, you know, you can run a signature. Cyber threat intelligence is the whole package. So I just want to make sure that we're talking about two different things. Because some people, they talk about it, gets a little synonymous, and they think it's the same thing. It's not. So information about enemy or potential enemy. So very important when I sit there and I say, I want to go to a command, uh, a DOD command. I want to go to the government. Um, I want to go to the healthcare system. I can't just say, hey, they're using a file called a.exe. Here's the hash of the file. Here's a signature of the file. You can put it in your firewall. You can block it. You can block it if it comes in. Hopefully it's not attached to a piece of um, an email and it's encrypted. And they didn't call it a.exe. They called it b.exe. But what I want to be able to tell that hospital or that government agency is, hey, this malicious file is coming from China. They're trying to steal your intellectual property. Or better yet, it's ransomware. It's going to lock down your system. And now you got to pay six Bitcoin, which is about $60,000 to get your, your, uh, your files unlocked. So let's talk about different kinds of intelligence, just so you kind of have a, a feel for it. So you have SIGINT which is signals intelligence. That would be like, say, like NSA uh, spoofing your cell phone and listening into your cell phone. Uh, signals intelligence may also be satellites. Uh, imagery intelligence. So we talk about planes flying over North Korea, photographing the camps there, the concentration camps, the labor camps there, uh, flying over Russia to see what the plane, you know, what new uh, ships are out there, what kind of radars on the ship. So you have imagery intelligence that can come from a plane. It can come from a person on the ground with a camera. Um, it can come from a satellite, human intelligence, that's your James Bond, your spy. Um, and sometimes that can be really good intelligence, but that's the most difficult kind of intelligence to get. Open source intelligence or OSINT, that would be anything that I can get, just open source. Uh, usually the internet, anything, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, GitHub, uh, people are out there putting all sorts of things out there. Um, some hackers will actually go out there and post some of their software and some information on GitHub, and then we can link it to some malicious activity they may be doing for a government agency or a criminal organization. And then there's always room it. Um, that's always good water cooler information. The reason I bring up these different ints is because there's different ways to get information. So when we look at cyber intelligence, which is considered an int depending on who you talk to, but right now we're gonna consider an int cyber intelligence. It actually is not one type of intelligence. It brings in usually three or four. So it brings in OSINT, which is open source intelligence. Again, can I find out, what can I find out about that hacker online? But it's also gonna bring in human. So for example, if it's a military unit um, in the Russia, it could be the GRU, the FSB. Um, in China, it could be the PLA, which is their intelligence agency that works for the Navy. Um, human intelligence. So I have a hacker. So why is he, he intruding upon an enterprise or a network? Why is he taking this information? Who is he getting his direction from? Well, if I can have a spy on the inside giving me that information, telling me why he's going to do it or telling me what they're going to target next, that would be great. Really hard to get though. Signals intelligence. Are they talking about it or can we intercept it while it's online, while they're chatting, email and such? So cyber intelligence, the tradecraft is still being developed. Um, give you an example that just kind of killed me. I was at a strategic meeting here in Washington, D.C. I started talking about cyber and uh, they, they used to, you know, when you're out there and you're talking to other people like grandmas and, and they're like, oh, their computer doesn't work. And so I'm in a strategic level meeting and I was talking about cyber and the person that was running this meeting, writing some national level programs said, you know, I just really don't know about this computer stuff. I just play Candy Crush on my phone. So I was like, please don't say that in public because um, that's, that's not good, right? But cyber, it's still being developed. Uh, you know, cyber forensics. Again, I started doing cyber forensics on a floppy diskette. We had to develop cyber forensics on a hard drive. Then gosh forbid, we had to do cyber 
We had to do forensics on a server. How do you do forensics on a server? What about a server that's mapped, you know, where it's multiple things and I have to explain to a judge um, who can't open an iPad about mapping to a server. And then all of a sudden now then encryption came up and everybody threw their hands up and they're like, oh no, they're encrypting it, they're encrypting it. And I'm in law enforcement and I'm thinking, they write down their password. They always write, everybody, you write down your password. Everybody does, right? Or there's other ways you can get the password out of a person. But there's, you know, so they encrypt, you know, an encrypted hard drive, encrypted files, and, and you still have to get around it. So now the big concern is, well, everybody's moving to the cloud. So how do you get forensics out of the cloud? Well, the same way. You just have to develop more techniques to do that. Um, what about AI? How am I going to start identifying a hacker if it's really a machine on the other side, having communications, emulating email communications, um, you know, changing their tactics as they go? Uh, playing capture the flag against a machine can be a lot different than playing capture a flag against another team um, if you're playing it you know, on a network, on an enterprise environment. So cyber threat intelligence, cyber intelligence is still being developed as technology changes. How we act and how we behave and how we collect information changes all the time. It does make it interesting. So what can we find when we're doing incident response? Enterprise has been intruded upon. How do we find out who did it, what did it? So a lot of times when we do technical analysis or forensics, we can find out when it happened. Now this is assuming that somebody has their logging turned on. And when we go to the facility, their logging is more than 72 hours because sometimes when they find the intruder on their network, it can take some time. Um, it used to be back in 2015 that the average time that an intruder was on a system was 480 days. It has been uh, shortened a lot. People are finding hackers and intruders on networks a lot quicker, but still, when did it happen? It's, if they're not logging, if they don't have good firewall logs, good information, it's really difficult to figure out when something happened. What happened? Did somebody find a vulnerability in an enterprise? Did they exploit that vulnerability to be able to get into the network? Or did they take an email and uh, you know make it like, you know, hey, um, I'm a Nigerian prince and I have money on the other side. And if you click this attachment, I will send you a million dollars to your bank account. And, and you know, it, you know, you think, who clicks on those? It works. There's like one out of 10,000 people still click, and that's all you need. Well, what happens when I sit there and go, okay, you know, uh, I can fish probably anybody in this room because, you know, all I need is your Facebook account. I got to see who your friend is. If I can figure out your email address, I can say I'm your friend and send you an email. Well, most corporations use first initial, last name, right? So if I want to fish... You know, I'm not telling you how to do this. Anyways, it's, it's not that difficult, right? But how do you fight you if you do forensics on an enterprise that has good logging, good information, usually you can figure out what happened. Did the malware get executed on the host machine? And then did the adversary, did the, the, the uh, malware call back to the adversary? Did he use a remote access tool, a rat, to get into the network, elevate his access from a user to administrative privileges, and then run through the network as an administrator. How did it happen? Again, was it the email? Was an ex was a vulnerability that was exploited? Where it happened sometimes can be a little bit more difficult. Again, it just has to do with good forensics. But good forensics on a system should be able to find these things out for you. What you can't find out, who did it? So when the malware lands on your system, is it John Smith that sent it? Or was it Susie Smith that sent it? Who wrote the malware? Who attached it? Sorry, I know there's a Susie in the room. Um, we know Susie didn't do it. Oh, no, sorry. Um, so it's, you know, who did it? Who's the person behind, behind that malware? Who actually sent it? Is the malware that was attached to the email that was sent to the person, who, the victim who opened it, well, is the person who set up the email account attached the malware the same as the person who wrote the malware? We don't know. It's really difficult. So then we go into a large hospital, cleared defense contractor like Boeing, Lockheed. Why were they intruded upon? Why is that hacker there? What information do they want? If we go back to the Department of Navy, they have 450,000 seats on their network. That's 450,000 users. It's a huge enterprise. If I find a hacker or an intruder in that enterprise, what are they after? It can be really, really difficult to figure it out. Because a lot of times, once you get somebody with administrative privileges in an enterprise, 
if you don't have internal logging and internal any type of anything going across, they can cross a network, take whatever they want. Where did it happen? Sometimes you just don't know. Um, if they're exploiting a vulnerability, it can be really, really difficult. And sometimes the when is almost impossible. So these are things when you're doing for forensics on an enterprise, what you can and cannot find out. The biggest problem is the intent. Ultimate source of internet, we don't know why. Give you a good example, we were working on some forensics on incident response. And the company was a company down in Florida that had uh, made electric blankets. And we were, we were working with Department of Defense and we're thinking, why would anybody hack a company that makes electric blankets? That's all they make. An analyst was able to research a little bit more and figure out that China was trying to dump very, very cheap electric blankets onto the US market. The company was making some complaints about it and they were gonna raise tariffs on the Chinese electric blankets. Let's talk about um, solar winds. It's a company that makes uh, solar panels. And if you haven't heard of the company, it's because it's out of business. So about 10 years ago, China intruded upon this company, stole all their intellectual property, took it back to China, made the, the uh, solar panels cheaper, a lot cheaper, and were able to dump them on the U.S. market and put the U.S. company out of business. There is a company, uh, Westinghouse, used to make small nuclear reactors here in the United States. They were bidding with Framatome, a French company that also made small uh, nuclear uh, reactors for energy. We're just talking energy power pants. China hacked both of them, stole their intellectual property, took it back to China, made them themselves. Both companies have since gone out of business. So this is now you hear about a lot of times about complaining about China and tariffs. A lot of this is pushing back on China for stealing the intellectual property. You know, one thing I sit there and say, you know, when you do research and development, it's very expensive, you know, prototyping, getting something to market, very, very expensive. It's a lot cheaper to just steal it. Not good, but it is cheaper to steal. So impossible to know. It really is impossible to know the intent. The intent can flip-flop. Once they get into a network, they can change what they want. They can see something else sexier. They can steal something else. They can double cross. We've seen intruders on networks where they knock each other off the network. They start arguing over uh, material. Um, they're from the same country. I don't get it anyways, but it would be like, you know, one team arguing another team because maybe they get a monetary bonus of who captures that, you know, that document or that intellectual property first. Indecision, uh, sometimes they just don't know what they're doing there and external forces blackmail. So sometimes you really just don't know what the intent is on the intruder that's in your network. And that can be very difficult. So enough, if you're an analyst, you can't really ever state it with certainty. They came into this company to steal this intellectual property, to take it back to their country so they could build it themselves. It's really, really hard to say that just by doing forensics on a network. Now, if I had some human intelligence that I could tie into that, it would make it a little bit easier. But how do you defend against that when you don't really know what they're going to steal or why they're going to steal it? So impossible to know what's really going on inside somebody's head. It is really difficult. And especially if your intruder that's intruding upon your network is multiple people, it's a team. It looks like one person, it can be a team. So there's um, a reporting out there and it's called Guccifer. So if you ever hear about the hacker Guccifer, the community for the longest time thought it was one person. It's not one person, it's a GRU team that was hacking. So they look like one, but it's actually a team that was doing that activity. So let's talk about the diamond model. So I did not develop the diamond model. It was created in a academic environment, but it, it explains some of the things that I talk about and some of the difficulties that we have when we're trying to ID who the adversary is or what they're doing on your network. So they just built, they just drew a diamond, very, very simple. At the top, they put the adversary, the hacker. And oh, by the way, if anybody wants to read ad nauseum papers regarding the diamond model that have been written by people with PhDs, uh, just Google diamond model. It's it's great reading. It's actually very interesting. But you put the adversary at the top, you put the victim at the bottom, whoever the enterprise that was hacked upon. So if you're sitting there as the victim, what do you see? You look up and what do you see? You see the infrastructure where the hacker came from. You can see maybe an IP address, maybe a domain. You can see the infrastructure. And on the right side, you see the capability. Uh, the malware, uh, how they acted, their, their tactics, their techniques, how they got into you. But you can't see the adversary. 
You don't know it was Jane Smith. You don't know it was John Smith. You don't know if it's Wang Dong. You don't know who it was. Now, you can possibly do forensics on the malware. And we used to be able to say, we used to do forensics on malware. And we could sit there and say, where was the malware compiled? If it was compiled on a computer that had Chinese language settings, and that's a heuristics that you can get when you do forensics on malware, we used to say 15, 20 years ago, oh my gosh, this malware was compiled on a computer with Chinese language settings. Hence, it is Chinese. And then it was like, oh, here's malware. It was compiled on a system and it has Arabic language settings. Hence, it's from the Middle East, Russia. Guess what? Oh, it's Russian. Um, and so we used to publish this information. Well, guess what? The adversary figured this out. They're able to circumvent that. And now we can't look really at the language settings where it was compiled and based on that, say for certainty, what country it came from. So, but there's other attributes that we can look at from the uh, capability standpoint, but we don't know who the adversary is. Sometimes we can surmise a country based on what they stole, their intent, their motivation. But who is it? If I want to stop them at the border, I don't know who it is. So when we look at it, again, we look at the capability, IP domain, email addresses, infrastructure, and this is switched. We're going to get off that slide real quick. Sorry, that, that slide. So when we look at it, from a network defense, you're sitting at the bottom. I want to defend my network. I'm the victim. I see the capability. I see the infrastructure. But the intelligence community, those are the three letter agencies, right? Um, or for example, I'm going to say the FBI. Um, the FBI wants to arrest somebody, but what they want is they want information on the adversary. So the intelligence community in the classified environment, they don't work. You know, if you think about NSA, CIA, FBI, uh, DOD, um, DOE, all these other agencies out there that are working in the intelligence community, a lot of them are not sitting in the network defense arena. Because think about FBI, what do they want to do? They want to cuff and stuff, right? Basically put handcuffs on the adversary and arrest them. They want to do indictments. They want to take them to court. To take somebody to court and to arrest them, I need to know who they are. I need a name, a birth date, social security number, national ID number, height, weight. I need to have them come into the United States. I'm focused on the adversary. So right now, if you're in the intelligence community, you're going to be focused usually on the top of the diamond model. The defense community is on, and network defense is on the bottom. This is important because you need to tie it together. You need to tie these two together. So for example, there's times the intelligence community will see something that a hacker is doing or set up to do, but how do you tell a network defender? And you're thinking, well, that's easy. We put out a report. We put out a, you know, a report saying, hey, here's some malware coming out there. But here's the problem. If I'm tracking the adversary and I put out that information on other people on to do it, and then it makes it into like the cyber threat feeds, the cyber threat intelligence, the antivirus software. If you're an adversary and you're building some malicious software, what are you going to do before you deploy it? You're going to test it against those feeds. If you have some malicious virus, you're going to test it against Norton and McAfee to make sure that it doesn't fire. You want your malicious software to be, you know, to go through and be able to deploy onto an enterprise. So it's really hard sometimes for the intelligence community to talk to the defense community. Then the network defense community can sometimes have problems talking to the intelligence community. Does anybody know the phone number for NSA? I mean, I guess you could tweet them at this point in time. They're probably looking at their tweets. You know, they got a Twitter account. But um, how do you just call them up and say, hey, here's a signature. You know, can you go do this in the intelligence community? I see this net defense. The other thing is a lot of intelligence communities, because of statutes and limitations and laws, they cannot act within the United States. So they, it has to do with jurisdictions and laws. And then also, if you don't recognize this, within how many law enforcement agencies are in the, there in the United States? A lot. You got one for each state. You got numerous federal agencies. Let's not even talk about all the cities' jurisdictions. And then you have all the other cats and dogs out there. So even just getting the law enforcement community to talk, how do you get the network defense community to talk? And then in the United States, we have 17 intelligence agencies. And trying to get them to talk is very, very difficult. We try. 
So one of the ways we also talk about network defense is we break it down. So giving you an analogy, dude's gonna break into the building. He's gonna break into a house, right? And uh, so before you break into a house, what do you do? You gotta check the house out, right? You wanna make sure it doesn't have any dogs. Uh, is, is, are there people there? Does grandma live there? Uh, is it better to break in during the day, at night? So what are you gonna do? You may drive up and down the street and look at the house, right? You're a burglar. And then you decide, okay, I'm gonna break into the house at eight o'clock in the morning, everybody's gone to work. So what do you do? You walk up to the house and you see a big rock and you're like, ooh, rock's gonna break window. I bend down, I pick up the rock. I got the rock, that's my weapon. I go up to the window, I threw it, throw the window, window's bashed open. I climb through the window. I'm now in the house. This is gonna be important here. But when I'm in the house, I'm gonna steal stuff. I'm not using the rock to steal stuff. I'm gonna take the pillowcase that was in my back pocket, go around, collect all the electronics, the iPads, the silver, the money, anything else that's cool. And I'm not gonna go back through the broken window because that's the front yard. I'm gonna go out the back door, right? I'm gonna open the back door and go out the back door. So the reason I break that down for you is think about this. If you're going to defend your house, you may think of different techniques to defend your house. Well, maybe I'm gonna put floodlights on the front yard. I'm gonna put a fence up so the, the burglar can't come up. I'm gonna take away the rocks so there's no rocks. I may put wire mesh over my windows. I may put an alarm on my house. So there's different, and also, you know, I don't know, you know, once he's in your house, I have a big Rottweiler. So let's now take it over to an enterprise, right? How is somebody mapping your network? Are they mapping it? Are they pinging it? What are they doing? So how can we look at that? So when we now think about how to defend your network, 15, 20 years it was, ooh, somebody broke into my network and they used this software, this malicious software. I'm gonna write a signature, I'm gonna put it on my firewall and that's all I can do. Well, now if we're doing network defense, let's do a little bit more, let's break it down. So let's talk about how they recon my network. Can I see it ahead of time? Can I look at my web logs and go, you know what? There's somebody with a computer that's basically keeps looking at some technology that I have advertised on my website. So if you go to a clear defense contractor, Boeing, Lockheed, they have pictures of missiles and airplanes and tanks. And if somebody keeps looking at my tanks and trying to get more information and using the search bar to find more information, does that give me information that somebody from that particular country with those language settings in their browser may then start intruding upon my network and going after that technology. What can we do when they look at rec you know, reconnaissance? Weaponization, can we somehow determine what they're doing, what type of malicious software they're going to attach to an email? So when they're building that malicious software, how can we, we prevent that or know about that beforehand? When they do the delivery, what can we do before, how, before they do an exploit and look for a vulnerability on our network, but also how can we better then defend our logs for any email that's coming in? Can we put more filters on our email? Can we basically block any attachments on our email? Can we block every single email that comes from the outside and basically say, this company is only going to accept email if it comes from an internal email address. So you can't get Hotmail Gmail. You know, or if it has an attachment from Gmail, I'm going to strip it. If it has a URL on a Gmail, I'm going to strip it or block that. So what techniques can we use before they basically deliver it to us? So exploitation. Is there something that I can do because a user is going to get that email. It's going to have a URL that's, that has some code embedded in it, or it has an attachment. What happens? What can I do? when the user clicks on that URL or clicks on that attachment and has that code execute on their host, on their desktop computer? Is there something that I can do, any information? So you know what, I don't want the firewall out there. I now want host-based security. I want security to run on the desktop computer. So if I see something that's unusual running on the desktop, can I block it or can I alert on it? So different ways, and, and when I think about Again, the reconnaissance, how I act as a network defender is going to be different than how I work if I'm trying to stop from exploitation. So installation of the malware, command and control, if they're coming in with a RAT, which is a remote access tool, how are they getting into the network? How are they controlling that malicious software? Is there something I can do that look at the traffic off and on my network 
to be able to determine if, if it's there, if it's going on, can I stop it? Um, and actions on objectives. If, they, if they're after some intellectual property, is it something like I can do to basically onion ring? Can I build some more defenses around that intellectual property? If I know I have something very, very sensitive on my network, do I want to air gap it? Take it off the network. Put it on a VPN. Put it someplace else. They can't go. So um, it's kind of interesting, but you have to think about this from a network defense very differently. You have to think about the phases that the adversary is going to use. Um, and that's, uh, when we talk about MITRE, we talk about something. There's a lot of things that we get into. A lot of the engineers break this down and really look at the different techniques. They look at the malware. They look at how we can better network defend. I look at the adversary. Um, that's something that's really cool that's out there um, that I don't have a slide about. Is So the Israelis shown in a theoretical lab that they can basically place malware onto an enterprise and they can have it basically encode the data and go across the power supply off the network. So think of it as like, and of course, I'm not technical, so this is how I have to explain it. It's like Morse code going off your power supply. Now, you have to be pretty close. You could probably put a UPS there. There's ways you can defeat it very, very easily. But if you think you air gapped your system, that's one, there's ways that you can possibly get around it. Israelis have shown you can go across the power supply. But then there's other th silly things. Like for example, um, we had some software that was malicious and it would be on um, a thumb drive, uh, iPhone, iPad, something that, had, that was removable. And it would sit on that particular device. If you plugged it into a computer, it would go to the most recent folder and take everything out of the most recent folders. If you had any doc files, and it would kind of scrape some very specific files down back to that removal of media, compress it up. Then it would kind of beacon out. And when it got an internet connection, it would take those files compressed up and shoot it back to the host country. So once we were doing an incident response, actually we were doing a, a criminal investigation and it was uh, some people in San Diego in the military and this one particular gentleman decided to charge his iPhone in a top secret environment. So he took his iPhone into what we call a skiff, top secret environment. He plugged the iPhone into the top secret computer just to charge it. That's all he was doing. Little did he know it had this particular set of malicious software in there. It scraped up a bunch of top secret material, compressed it onto his phone, and sent it out over across the internet. So these things do happen. And I will tell you, the user is always, always your biggest vulnerability when you talk about network defense. It's, it's amazing what they can do to thwart you. So again, let's get back to the reason I bring this back up about the diamond model intelligence at the top. So the intelligence community is looking at the adversary. They may be looking at the adversary and what the infrastructure is that the adversary is using and the capability. The network defender, the people that got intruded upon, can't really see the adversary. So it makes it really difficult to say. So when we look at it, I'm going to run through this. Whoops. When we look at this and we say, who is the adversary? How much information about the adversary does a network defender need to know? What do they need to know about the adversary? Well, it, some things can help you. If, for example, you know their tactics and their techniques and we can, we can bucket their information, and I'll get to that in a sec, it kind of helps. But the victim, it's very, very hard. Um, and the victim is usually focusing on network defense. But when we talk about who the adversary is, so now we're going to get into kind of a little bit like what I do. We talk about who is the adversary. You got bank robbers. Probably, I, you know, I really, really appreciate a, a smart criminal. Uh, the stupid ones get caught all the time. And I really appreciate a good intrusion. Um, because, I mean, when people really like go in and they steal stuff and they get away with it, um, it's like, hey, it's it's really amazing. You, you got to, and, and if you're working in law enforcement, you see the same thing over and over and over again. So let's talk about bank robbers. Um, ransomware, dating scams, fake checks. There's a really good story out there about the Bank of Bangladesh um, that got hit. They were almost got a billion dollars. They only ended up with $80 million over the weekend. Um, that was a really good robbery right there, $80 million in three days. Um, and I could, they, what they did was, uh, in this particular case, banks 
have a system on top of them called a SWIFT system. So for example, the Bank of America sitting here in the United States, if they want to transfer money to Wells Fargo, they don't just send Wells Fargo a check or how does that money go? So it's like a bank on top of banks that basically transfers money around if it's needed. So a bank in Bangladesh was going to be transferring millions of dollars to a bank in the Philippines. But what the hacker did was they disabled the printer in the Bank of Bangladesh. The printer was going to print off confirmation of transfer requests. So think about this. I'm in Bangladesh. I want to transfer $10 million to the Philippines. I send a transfer request to the bank in New York because that happened to be one of the hubs. And I tell the bank in New York, transfer $10 million from my account to the account of a bank in the Philippines. Bank of New York sends a confirmation of that transfer back to Bangladesh and it's supposed to print out. The hackers disabled the printer. So they weren't seeing the confirmation of the transfer request. It was also a three day weekend because there was a holiday. So it goes in on Friday. These transfer requests were going through. They're going to try to get about a billion dollars. So what happened was after about $100 million, New York notices there's a typo in some of the transfer requests. So they call Bangladesh and go, you know, you're not spelling, you know, I think it was uh, transfer, right? They, they misspelled some words, but nobody's there in Bangladesh because now it's the weekend. So New York stops the transfers after $100 million. So $100 million goes to the Philippines. In the meantime, Sunday, their Sunday, our Sunday, their Monday, Bangladesh comes in, fixes their printer. All these transfer requests comes off their printer. They freak out. They are missing $100 million. They think it's actually a lot more. They try to call New York. Problem is, their Monday is our Sunday. Nobody's in New York. So they're trying to stop it. So it comes around up on Monday, and everybody gets on the phone, and $100 million is gone. Are we done? Lights just went off. <laughs> oh, no. $100 million is gone. They were able to get about $20 million back, but $80 million went to a casino in the Philippines. Guess what? Casino in the Philippines doesn't have money laundering laws. The guy who pulled out the $80 million said, you know what? It was a debt. I was owed it. Peace out. He walked away with $80 million. I love it. I love a good bank robbery, right? Nation state. Um, oh, also ransomware. That's a good one. I always love good ones, right? So do you know when you're thrown some ransomware and ransomware usually runs down onto, let's say, something like a hospital or a city, an enterprise that needs their network up, all right? And they go in and they ask for a six Bitcoin. That's $60,000. If you're a hospital, $60,000 to get your, your files unencrypted, keep your hospital up, or you take three to four weeks to rebuild your computer system. You lose patients, you can't do surgeries, you may have to ask people to leave the hospital. Some hospitals are gonna pay that ransomware. But here's the problem. When you throw some ransomware onto a victim, what's gonna usually happen? You're gonna get some IT person. Okay, I'm older, so I can say this. So it's gonna be some 45 year old man and they're gonna say, we want six Bitcoin to unlock your system. Now. Does anybody's parents in this room know how to buy Bitcoin? Okay, I'm not gonna ask if you all know how to buy Ethereum, Bitcoin, but let's talk your parents, right? If you had to ask your dad to transfer you a Bitcoin, right, right? That's what's gonna happen. So how can you throw some ransomware on an enterprise and then tell them to pay you in Bitcoin when they don't know how to do that? So what, is the, what do the people do? These hackers have set up help centers. So they will help you to figure out how to establish a wallet, buy the Bitcoin, transfer the money. But here's the other thing. If you're a kidnapper or you have some ransomware, you don't want to throw some ransomware on a system, have somebody pay you the money and not unencrypt their files. But what if the IT person on the victim side doesn't know how to unencrypt all the files? You call the help desk. So the hacker will actually walk you through unencrypting your files and making sure you get back to your good state of readiness because he wants to make sure when he goes down the street and hacks and throws ransomware on another hospital that they hear that, yeah, you pay the Bitcoin, they'll help you, they'll unencrypt your files. It's a good business model. So kind of things that I think are fun and sexy. 
So nation state, those would be if, you know, a nation, Russia, China, Hacka, uh, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea are the one, the big four um, that are going out there trying to steal some intellectual property. Corporate spy, um, if you, again, it's cheaper to steal it than to research it and develop it yourself. Rogue gamer, how many people have lost their loot box? Not me. Um, I never, never had my loot box stolen because that would never happen in Minecraft or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, we've had people come up to police departments and complain that somebody stole their sword or I paid for a skin and I didn't actually get it. Um, yeah. So hacktivists, political statements, botnets, uh, adware spammers, um, sport hacker, uh, somebody who's just doing it for grins and giggles, accidental hacker and the cyber terrorists. So the ones that we're really, really interested in, obviously, is the nation state hackers and the cyber terrorists. So think about this. We took some airplanes, we threw them into the World Trade Center, um, and it was a horrendous terrorist attack. What happens if we have a terrorist over in Syria, Iraq, um, Afghanistan, Yemen, who decides that, you know what, he's going to hack into our power and electric system, and he's going to open the floodgates to the Hoover Dam? What would happen then? We would flood part of Arizona, Nevada, and Southern California. Catastrophic property loss, catastrophic uh, air, uh, people, um, and it would really uh, um, hit our agriculture system that's dependent on that water. So it's something that could happen. It hasn't happened yet. So how do we figure out who, when I'm sitting here telling you everything that's really hard when we go to the enterprise and we try to figure out who's hacking into our system. So if I, if I can't look at the malware, I can't look at their TTPs, I have to look at everything as a package, right? Because you know what? If somebody throws some malware down, how do I know if it came from Russia, China, Vietnam, where? So I also can look at their motivation. Who are they attacking? And I also can look at the targets. So a very good example is if you're a cyber terrorist, usually your motive is political in nature. Usually a terrorist is not going to throw down ransomware on a hospital to get money. But a cyber terrorist, their motive is going to be political, and they're usually going to go after infrastructure, extortion, influence, political processes. Versus, let's say, a nation state, nation state being another country's government, during peacetime, their motivations may be political, military, national secrets, or economic. So if we look and we look at what the motive was, if we can do forensics during an intrusion, during incident response, we can look at what the motive was who, and who they went after, and we look at what their targets were, it helps us sometimes maybe identify who, who the actual threat actor was, or at least it may help us identify down to at least a country. So where can we get some threat intelligence? Where do we go? Where, where, do, where do organizations get at the hospital, the enterprise? Department of Homeland Security puts out information. They put it out for free. Um, it's aggregated. Uh, you also can go to some ISAOs, information sharing organizations. So what happened was, um, you know, the, the Department of Defense, the government had some problems getting some information out to the community and the community couldn't really wait for them. So the first group of people that got together that was sector based was the cleared defense, uh, defense contractors. So these de cleared defense contractors uh, decided to get together and share information. So you had like Lockheed, Boeing, Martin Marietta, General Dynamics, even though they compete trying to sell airplanes, engines, ships, things to the DOD, their IT people got together, their security IT people together and started sharing information. They started sharing information about techniques, tactics, procedures, hashes, anything that they could both do to protect their network. But it also spread out. So think about this, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's, the retail sector. They were, the hackers on that were hitting the point of sale devices where you swipe your credit cards. So the software, the malicious software that hits a clear defense contractor is usually going to be a little bit different that hits the retail sector and yet even different from what hits the banking sector. So there has been some information sharing and analysis organizations, nonprofit organizations that are sector based that have come together in the United States to share this threat information. So if you're, for example, if you're working in the retail sector and you're working network defense, you want to go to a retail ISAL where other retail organizations that are working in network defense are sharing this information. So there's a lot of information that's out there for free. And then there's a lot of people that are making money off of this. FireEye, Cisco, Looking Glass. 
So what's happened is, is that when these companies were intruded upon, they needed somebody to come do incident response. Well, the FBI doesn't have a lot of people. If you try to call the local law enforcement, they have no idea really what to do and they don't have the resources. So these companies have started up in the last five to 10 years. So if you're a, a Boeing, a Lockheed, the local bakery down the street, and you've been intruded upon, who do you call? You call a company that's actually doing incident response. They will help you come out, helpfully identify the intruder, get the intruder off your network, um, clean up your network, you're going to pay for it. You know, premium service package, right? But they also can possibly sell you some cyber threat intelligence. So if you're a large organization, you're running a security operations center, most likely you're going to end up basically going to a contract with a company to give you cyber threat intelligence, just as if you would go to an antivirus vendor to give you that antivirus software. So it's not really a whole heck of a lot different, but there are some notable ones out there. There is a list of about 100 cyber threat intelligence vendors that are out there. If you're going to start talking to them, you've got to be a little bit careful because you have to know where they're incorporated at. So, for example, if I say Kaspersky gives you cyber threat intelligence, you may want to know that Kaspersky is in Russia. So you may want to question or at least be cognizant of the information that they're giving you or your corporation. These are also really good places because they have a lot of reports out there. I have some here. Um, these companies publish reports. Uh, and what they do, it's a selling tactic to sit there to go to a corporation to say, hey, here's a report on the latest vulnerability or this latest threat actor of what they're doing. So if you need to get smart on some cyber threat actors, go to FireEye, go to Kaspersky. Um, go, MITRE has a lot of information on their website also. So what do you need to know? Remember that diamond model that I kept talking about in your network defense? So we sit there and we say, how much information do you need to know? So these are some Iranian cyber threat actors. There's been an indictment against them, which is like an arrest warrant. And the FBI has put their pictures out there with their names. Now, it's going to make them very difficult for them to travel, to travel to the United States or any country where we have extradition. But if you're a network defender, if you're defending your network, do you need to know that it's Wang Dong that's hitting your network or you just need to know it's China? So you have to think about where you're sitting, what you're doing, what industry you're in, how much information you need to know. So how do we get to attribution? I'm going to kind of speed it up just here a little bit. How do we get to attribution? It's hard. You've got, again, look at the targets, where they're going, the motivation. We can look at the malware. We can look at the infrastructure that they're coming from. And we have a lot of information to put together. So why do we need an attribution? Well, if you're Department of Justice, if you're law enforcement, because I want to arrest you. I want to do indictments. Maybe it's a political action. The first report that went out came out of FireEye, and it was called APT1, and it was regarding the PLA out of Guangzhou, China. In that particular case, it was the U.S. government making a statement to China that we know you're hacking us, and this is how we know. It's about a 70-page report that details where they are, where they're coming from, their infrastructure, their malware, and it has a lot of information. So it put it out to the public to say, look, this is how we know China has intruded upon our networks and is stealing our intellectual property. So the benefits is also planning and defense. You know, if we can know more about it, we can put more reports out there. It helps us from the defensive posture also. So what about namings? This is something that can get very, very confusing. So we look at the Chinese circle here and we have PLA. The PLA is the Chinese Navy and they do a lot of uh, intelligence activities. They also do a lot of cyber threat activity, and that's the PLA. For example, this particular group is out of Guangzhou, China. They have intruded upon a lot of companies. But if you look up their names and you go to different corporations, they have different names, and it's just because it happens. So, for example, when FireEye does a report and they identify a group and they can go back to attribution, and usually if a corporation is doing it, they're just going to go to the country and maybe an organization. They usually don't go down to a person's name when they do a report. If FireEye, which is, does incident response and cyber threat intelligence reports, if they do a report and they identify a group, they're gonna call it APT and a number. APT is Advanced Persistent Threat. It's just a corporate name for that particular group of hackers. Now, the problem is Cisco wants to sell their information, wants to sell their, their capabilities, so they put out a report too. 
but they're not going to call it APT1 or APT2 because that's what FireEye called it. So they're going to call it Putter Panda. They're talking about the same people, right? Think of this like Cali Cartel down in Mexico dealing drugs. One group's going to call it Putter Panda. It's actually Cali Cartel. One group's going to call it APT2. And guess what? Then you bring in another group, you bring in CrowdStrike, and they're going to call it Group 36. They're all the same group, different names. You're doing network defense. Is it confusing? Absolutely confusing. The Russians, this particular group is called APT29, Daisy Duke, Office, or Cozy Bear, depending on what corporate report you look at. So it's just plain frustrating. But what you can do, there is a GitHub site, and this is every single cyber threat analyst usually has this Excel spreadsheet on their desk. So then I'm going to look down and go CrowdStrike versus FireEye versus Mandiant versus Symantec. How do I know they're talking about the same group? And you want to look, if you're doing a network defense, you need all these reports. Then to make it even more difficult, if you're working in the US government, they give it a different name because why not? And that's not public in, in the public domain, right? So it's very confusing, but if you hear Cozy Bear, APT2, they could be talking about the same group of people. Open source reporting, there's a lot of it out there. So if you're a network defender, if you're in school trying to do a research project, if you want to get smart before you go do a job interview, look at this open source reporting. If you're trying to do something from the network defense and you want to see what the adversary is doing, these are very, very detailed reports. There's a lot of it out there. You can search APT. You can search Chinese hacker, North Korea hacker, Vietnamese hacker, uh, hacker groups. Uh, sort When you do Google, just sort it down to the last month, the last year. You'll come up with some very recent reporting. Also, look at the MITRE attack group. So MITRE has basically categorized a lot of these threat groups on how they act. And it really helps the community defend their network. So if there's a MITRE attack, which I didn't go into too much here, basically, if I want to look at one particular group, the APT1 out of Guangzhou, China, I can see how they work across on a network, which also helps me basically go into a network defense posture. Attribution errors. Sometimes this happens and it's happening more frequently. So just because something looks like something, it's not always that. And for those of you on Tinder, you probably know this, right, everybody? You should. So in February, I know I'm not on Tinder, but I hear about it. So February 2015, <laughs> there was an email sent to some women down in South Carolina. They were on some military bases and they were wives of some military members. So they received an email that basically said, Dear Angela, bloody Valentine's Day. We know everything about you, your husband, your children. We're much closer to you than you can ever imagine. That would be a little bit discouraging to get that type of email, would it not? And the graphic that was attached to this is the graphic that you see in the picture that says Cyber Caliphate. You are going to think that you were just targeted and received an email from the Cyber Caliphate, which is a terrorist organization. This is the same time over in France that there was some unrest, there were some shootings in a magazine and some bars there, and that was from some Muslim extremists that did attack them. Um, there was a TV station, Telemundo TV5, that was taken off the air in France for about six hours. The same time that that TV station was taken off the air, they also had their websites attacked, and it was replaced with the graphics of the cyber caliphate. So during this whole time, not only people in America, but in France were thinking that the cyber caliphate, a group they have never heard of, but it's a terrorist group, was now doing cyber intrusions, taking down television stations, sending out threatening emails, and also basically defacing websites. It took the community about six months to realize this was not a new ISIS group. It's not terrorist. It's actually the Russians messing with us. So it does happen. So it's very easy to take somebody else's software. It's very easy to emulate somebody's infrastructure. It's very easy to fake who you are, which makes my job as a cyber threat analyst even that much more difficult. And I have to rely on the technical reports, the information regarding the malware, the infrastructure, but I also have to look at the motivation and the intent and why they're doing it. So this is a good example of how things people can get things wrong for almost six months. So what does a bad guy look like? This is what the bad guy, how, how easy is it to change your skin, change who you look like? It's very easy, very, very easy. If nobody gets this joke, I need to change this graphic. April Fool's Day, come on, people. No, no, okay. Anyways, it was a, it was like, it's not CSGO, it's, it's uh, yeah, thank you. 
and they change the map and they change everything. I thought it was pretty good, but it's very easy. It's very, so attribution is very, very difficult. So as a network defender, it makes that even more difficult. So with that said, I'm gonna open it up to questions. And if uh, you ask some questions, I may or may not be able to answer just depending on if you get very specific. Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Or how it relates to MITRE? No, I just like confuse everybody. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Back to you. I mean, that's, that is the end of it. Um, thank you all again for coming. Uh, feel free to email at the tech talks, my, uh, tech talks at MITRE.org. If you are interested in working at MITRE or if you want more information about what we do, and that comes directly to me, and I will make sure that it gets uh, to the people that are responsible for those areas or responsible for I don't know if there's still food out there, but if there is, feel free to grab some food, some food on your way out. I think there's at least cookies and soda. Just saying. Thank you all. <laughs>